Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Telephone conversations with her mother were an ordeal. Kathy knew in advance that after the inevitable questions about the weather, work, and food, it would be time for sighs and admonitions. Do you have a fiance? Mom, the girl smiled, trying her best not to be annoyed. You asked me that a week ago. Do you think anything has changed since then? Who knows? Mom philosophized. Your father saw me at the New Year's Eve party, said, I'm getting married. And three days later we had already applied. A month later we got married, and we still live to this day, we've raised two children. You and dad are just lucky, Kathy answered. She hated to hear that wonderful story every time. As the years passed, she began to think that her mother was either bragging or trying to convince herself that she was doing well. Kathy was well aware that her father had a mistress in town, and her mother was often away to see her friend, for a reason. But her parents continued to live together, and they portrayed a happy married couple so devoutly that she tried to visit them less often. You should get married, Kathy, my mother sighed. A husband and kids. You live alone like a lonely beggar, with no one to take care of you. Why? Kathy was still hoping to reduce the conversation to a joke. I have a cat. I told you about him. But mom was not so easy to dislodge from the wave of moralizing. A cat. What a cat. What's the big deal? A wordless brute. I'm sorry no one needs you. And what are you worse than the others, I ask you. Eh, if I were in town, I'd marry you off quick. Kathy, do you have any neighbors who aren't married? I'd invite them over for tea. I don't know mom, the girl was getting nervous. I'm at work all the time, I don't talk to my neighbors. And you find out, and invite me to visit. Wear a dress or a skirt after all, all those jeans. Mom was unstoppable, and usually at the stage of advising her to give up her nightmare jeans, in favor of exciting menace, Kathy remembered something important and rushed to say goodbye. Afterward, she usually felt a slight sense of guilt about having to cheat on her mother. So it was this time too, but with some correction. There was no need to feel guilty. Kathy was really in a hurry to get to work. Tonight was her night shift, which meant it wouldn't be boring. For some reason maternity hospitals are always at their busiest at night. Women love to give birth at night. Is it the quiet that makes it work? Running through the square near the maternity hospital, the girl heard a strange sound. Most of all, it sounded like someone's agonizing, ragged breaths. The sound resonated, echoing off the trees, confusing. Kathy thought, at first, that she could hear breathing nearby, almost behind her back. But as she listened, she realized, no, the breaths, now joined by low moans, were coming from behind the briar bushes not far from the road. She quickly, without thinking, followed the sound. Now she could distinguish the voice too. People. Somebody. The man clearly wanted to call for help, but he was not very good at it. His voice was breaking off and getting quieter by the second. Who are you? The wounded man wheezed, looking at the girl with dilated eyes. You are quiet. If you talk too much, you'll bleed to death, you idiot. In the twilight of the evening, the wound was invisible. The girl knelt down and carefully felt the man's face and neck. It seemed to be the neck. Your name is... Kathy. Kathy is my name. Get out of the way. The scarf, tightly knotted, wouldn't budge, and she didn't immediately realize that it wasn't the tight knot. It was just that the cloth was soaked in blood that it was hard to untangle. How much had he already lost? She tugged on the scarf in desperation loosening the noose. Be patient, be patient, that's the way it has to be. The blood was gushing, and it took Kathy a few seconds to rip the scarf off the wounded man and reach for the carotid artery. The wounded man tried to say something. Quiet, be quiet, she commanded, clamping the right spot. I'm going to call an ambulance. What's wrong? Someone asked, and Kathy glanced away, staring at a man's black sneakers, probably a passerby saw a man in a pool of blood and her on his knees. Do you need any help? Call an ambulance. She threw me a curt word. She said, it's a stab wound to the neck and there's a lot of blood loss. Her fingers began to cramp. Kathy gritted her teeth and shook her head stubbornly. She couldn't let go of the pressure. Got it. 
now. The man closed his cloudy eyes tiredly. Stay awake. She shouted the words sharply, harshly, and accompanied them with a full-blown slap. He woke up in an instant and looked at the girl in surprise and a little hurt. He didn't have time for manners right now. That's what it takes to bring you to your senses. Don't sleep. Talk to me. Do you remember any poems? Read it. And without waiting for an answer, she began. There's a lonely white sail. In the midst of the blue sea, the man said in a low voice. Come on, well done, she rejoiced. And together they went on. What is he looking for in a land far away? What did he leave behind in his native land? There's an ambulance coming. Kathy heard the stranger's voice again. Just now she raised her head and looked at him. A redhead, about 30 or 35. Face anxious, frightened. She could see how pale with fright he was. The freckles burning on his face, white as a bandage. You might as well light up the street with them. Thank you for your help, she said softly. Thank you, she said softly. I was just walking by, and I looked, and he didn't finish. He stepped back, making way for the ambulance van. A full, elderly female doctor was already leaning over the wounded man. Him, she whistled, and looked approvingly at Kathy. Well done, girl. He owes you his life. Well done. Well, sickly one, she said to the wounded man, now let's go to the cure. Kathy groaned softly as she rose from her knees. Her back stiffened from the immobility and her knees ached too. Good luck, she said quietly. The man's fingers wrapped around her wrist. I owe you one, he smiled. Even though, shut up, you've got time. The doctor shouted at him. Even though I don't live rich, but still, find it in my jacket. On the right. Kathy obediently slipped her hand into the pocket of his blood-stained jacket and pulled out a cardboard rectangle of business cards. That's it, that's it. We don't have time for pleasantries. The doctor hurried up again. We must go. James Brooks. Kathy read aloud and looked off into the distance at the narrow, winding road. The ambulance was already far away. It would seem that for a medic the sight of blood is commonplace. There is nothing to talk about. But it's one thing to see blood in a hospital, where you have everything you need to save a life. And it's quite another to walk down the road and suddenly see a man bleeding to death. And the only things you need are your own hands, and maybe some reflexes too. Kathy then seemed that the sudden accident didn't hurt her usual focus. She wasn't even late for work, except that when she changed into her hospital uniform, she saw two bloodstains on her knees, and then she was hysterical. She clamped her hand over her mouth and breathed deeply, hoping to get the vile little shivers out of her muscles, but somehow the shaking got worse. Sobs erupted through her clenched teeth. I can't, she barely spoke, I can't, I can't, I can't. She heard footsteps behind her, and then strong arms around her shoulders. Quiet, she heard a familiar voice. What's got into you? Calm down, come on. I was on my knees, I had to. He was on the ground. She struggled to explain to the nurse, Emily, who had come to help. And there was blood, a puddle of jeans soaked. There was blood all over. Emily hugged her tightly, gently stroking her head. It's all right, Kathy. Her voice sounded like a soothing recitative. The jeans are crap. We'll wash them. Give them to me, give them to me. She pulled at the pant leg, which Kathy was still clutching in her fingers, white with tension. Good girl, Kathy, good girl. Now we'll pour our Olyushka some tea, and I'll deal with these stains. That's all? Don't cry, my dear, no need to cry. She nudged the girl to the couch, slipped the cup of hot tea into her hands and vanished. The head of the department looked in on Kathy ten minutes later. Did Emily tell you? Kathy asked grimly. Emily, he didn't deny it. Why? As a matter of fact, Kathy might not have asked that question. It wasn't even about Emily. It was just that the head of their department was an extraordinary man. For instance, he had a phenomenal memory, and he never forgot how many babies had been born in the hospital in any of the past 365 days. David always answered instantly and unmistakably, and gave the names and surnames of the women giving birth and the sex of the babies born. But his superpowers were not limited to this. 
Somehow the supervisor was also constantly aware of everything that was going on in the department. He knew when Cindy the nurse had kicked her philandering husband out of the house. He knew that Nancy the midwife's eldest son had graduated with an F in math. And he remembered that Emily hated strawberry jam, but loved buckthorn jam. Behind his eyes, the head of the department had long been called Superman. And now, as usual, this Superman knew everything that was needed. As always, he was one of the first to know. David sat across from the girl and took a bag of tea from the table. He thoughtfully twirled it in his hands. The box had a picture of a tropical landscape, several palm trees and a long caravan against the background of the setting sun. Probably India, Kathy said, or maybe Ceylon. Superman hummed and set the box aside. I've never tasted such a thing. My wife likes leaf tea with jasmine or something. Is this tea good? Can I buy you one? Kathy didn't move. For some reason, there was no strength at all. You didn't come here for tea, did you? She asked tiredly. The chief doctor pretended to sigh. You can't be fooled, can you? That's a good thing. You're smart. Mark my words, you'll take my place again. In time, of course. God forbid, said the girl. I have enough responsibility in my place as it is. You're right, David agreed, and he was silent for a while. You wanted to talk. He nodded. Don't be angry with Emily, she did the right thing. Well, you can't work in your condition, think about it. Let's do this to you. If you're going home now, have some cognac, 30 drops. It'll stop shaking. Then fall into a bath, preferably with herbs. Peppermint will do, or motherwort if you have it. Make the water warm, so it was pleasant to lie down, but not hot. And for half an hour, you lie there, relaxing. You can put on a Walkman, something soothing, once you're out, go to bed and watch a movie. Well, whatever you like. Half an hour before you go to sleep, take a sleeping pill. Come to my place before you go, I'll give you some. You'll sleep, and in the morning you'll feel better. Don't go to work, take three. No, better four days off. And don't sit in the city either, there's no need. Go to the countryside, visit your parents. There's silence and fresh air. You'll go back to work as good as new. Don't listen to your mother's talk about marriage. You'll say, I'm on vacation, I'm stressed. She'll leave you alone. I don't want to rest, Kathy muttered. The thought of spending a few days being lectured by her mother made her sick. I'm better off at work, I'll wake up faster. Kathy, David shouted. I'm not doing psychotherapy with you. Have you forgotten where you work yet? Have you forgotten? Well, I'll remind you. This is a maternity ward. We help people come into the world. And I don't want any hysterical midwives with shaking hands. I don't want you here for four days, understand. Then you're dismissed. Now on the bumpy bus back to town, Kathy remembered the conversation with a smile. David may have been a stern looking uncle, but he had the kindest soul. He was right to send her off to rest. At home with her parents, the nightmare memories faded, ceased to be frightening. And eventually Kathy began to think that everything that had happened to her was nothing more than a random scene from a horror movie. Spectacular, but irrelevant to real life. All these days the girl went to bed early, got a good night's sleep, and wandered through the woods during the day. Her mother, of course, was not too happy about this. She would have liked her daughter to visit her neighbors, especially since her son had come to visit them from the city. People said he was recently divorced but Kathy could not be persuaded, and in the end, the mother abandoned her attempts. The bus shook gently. Kathy stared out the window, automatically counting off the turns. It was still a long way to town. Her parents' bag of goodies was under the seat, and it didn't bump the girl's feet much every time she turned. Mom, as usual, had enough food to feed a company of hungry soldiers. Amazing. When Kathy was a child, and her older brother came from town, Mom would not let him go back without a whole trunk full of pies, pickles, and compotes. Besides, my mother managed to stuff a couple of pieces of meat and a few kilos of potatoes into the bag. But my brother married early, and he had six children, so my mother's gifts were always useful. What about her, Kathy? Why does she need so many of her mother's delicacies? I mean, she lives alone. Well, almost alone. No husband, no kids. 
No, it's not that she hasn't had affairs in her life. Of course there have been. But no family. Although of course, it could still happen. After all, she's only 30. Not old enough these days. A girl. A girl, no matter what her mother says. In the meantime, she lived with a cat. The cat, by the way, might not have been there either. Kathy, like most villagers, believed that animals had no place in the house. So the cat in the life of the owner appeared by accident. She dropped him off in the staircase as a weak old kitten. The baby was very small, skinny, squeaky, his eyes had not opened yet. How could she leave him alone? It's not human. Kathy hoped to take the baby out and then find him owners, but somehow it did not work out. No one she knew wanted to take the mongrel cat, and she was afraid to give him to strangers. Now he has grown up, but the abandonment at such a tender age still left its mark. The cat, despite Kathy's untiring care, had grown scraggly, skinny, despite his excellent appetite, and his hair was constantly hanging in tangles. The green eyes had a gangly expression, and this discouraged guests from petting the kitty. The cat, however, repaid his rescuer with the most fervent affection, always waiting for her from work. And at night he always tried to sneak up and murmur in her ear a simple cat's lullaby. This affectionate purr made me fall asleep better. The bus shook again, but this time somehow very thoroughly. What's going on in there? Someone in the cabin was indignant. Are they broken again? They're broken, the others grumbled grudgingly. This is the first time. That's how they are, the crooks. They drive around in junk cars, just to get more of our money. And the fact that people need to go to the city, no one cares. 20 minutes, the driver announced nonchalantly. If anyone needs to go to the bathroom or have a smoke, take the opportunity. The chorus of dissatisfied voices immediately subsided. What if I don't eat anything? Mumbled the indignant grandmother. The old woman was still itching to fight, and the driver was well aware of that. Then there's the spontaneous market by the side of the road, he smiled. You can buy some goodies inexpensively, or just have an interesting conversation. Kathy involuntarily suddenly laughed, because he was so confident and friendly, this charming driver. Still smiling, she rose from her seat and headed for the exit. Along the curb stood several ancient old women and an elderly man in his sixties. Instead of counters in front of the traders were ordinary wooden crates, on which was located all the poor assortment. The man was selling mushrooms and pine cones. The grandmother's counters were filled with jars of jam and pickles. Take the mushrooms, you can fry them for your husband with the potatoes. The merchant suggested in a cheerful voice. I don't have a husband, laughed the girl, only a cat and you bake, and the husband will appear. The man didn't get confused. The smell from the roast will make any man smell it through three doors. Look, look here, what a commodity. He grabbed the first mushroom he saw and handed it to her. But you just smell it. It smells like a forest, thick forest, the will. He's drunk again, muttered the old woman standing nearby, giving the merchant a stern look. He always, when he gets drunk, she turned to the girl, he starts talking about the will. His wife drives him drunk, so he hides from her in the thickets. Shush, old woman. The man waved her off angrily. It's her senility that makes her not know what she's talking about, he told the girl confidentially. Don't listen to her. The old woman's mind has been worn out for a long time. I'll get you, granny. Oh, I'll get you. I'm not afraid of you, one-eyed man. The old woman fearlessly turned to him, waving a zakshini at the enemy. What? The man's eyes widened in amazement. Who was that one-eyed man me? Now both of them had forgotten about the girl and were engrossed in figuring out their personal relationships. Apparently, it wasn't the first time. It certainly wouldn't be the last time. Kathy absent-mindedly went from one makeshift counter to another. It was silly, of course, to buy something when you had a whole bag of village gifts with you. Take some cucumbers, my daughter, one of the old ladies said to her, they're delicious and fragrant. They're crunchy and have a good bitterness. I add a currant leaf. The grandmother, as Kathy noticed, was dressed very neatly but poorly. The sweater, neatly stitched at the elbows, was about 25 years old, if not 30. And the boots, though carefully polished, must have been in the hands of a cobbler more than once, and had been through a lot of mending. 
Are the pickles good then? She smiled. How much for the jar? This one, the bigger one. Grandma sighed and threw up her hands. Give as much as you can, daughter. I don't know how much to ask. But you're selling. The girl frowned. How could you not know? The old woman lowered her eyes. And I wouldn't have sold if I hadn't been forced to, she answered quietly. My pension is small, so I either have to do what I want or disappear. So I sell off what's left in the basement. And your children and your grandchildren? Have they abandoned you? Kathy herself did not understand why she was continuing this conversation. But Grandma was so sweet and so lonely that not talking to her seemed like a total pig. Children, my daughter went to the city 25 years ago and bygones be bygones. So that's how it is. The daughter is forgotten, she doesn't look up, and the old mother is standing in the October wind, trying to make a living. Poor grandmother, but is she poor? Who knows what kind of mother she was? Maybe her daughter ran away at the first opportunity and forgot her childhood like a bad dream. We start in five minutes. The driver shouted loudly from the bus. If you can't make it in time, you can't make it, because seven don't wait for one. Take it. Kathy handed the old lady a paper bill folded in half. Ten dollars? Grandma stared at the money in shock. That's a lot of money, my daughter. Fine. Kathy waved, grabbed the can, and ran toward the bus. As she climbed onto the step, she waved to the old lady once more. The driver, who was watching the whole scene, grinned into his mustache. You shouldn't do that, he said softly as the girl entered the salon. These people are very clever, they have a sob story made up for everyone. And people listen and pay. Kathy shrugged her shoulders, she didn't feel like answering. At work she was greeted with a friendly hooray and a whole heap of hilarious banter. Look who's back. Look what the outdoors does to people. Emily laughed as she walked around Kathy. How fresh she looked. Cheeks round and ruddy, and she herself. Blood with milk. Is she in love? Found herself a shepherd and lured him to the hayloft. Admit it, Kathy. Lured, lured, lured. Kathy agreed. It's time for you to get married, girl. You're as ripe as a honeydew apple. Love is the best cosmetics. Nancy said with a scholarly look. I don't claim to be the author, it was said by someone great, and I just repeated it. Did you bring the bridegroom from the village, Alda? It's time to think about your family, and you're still in the clouds. Girls, Kathy smiled, I brought you some goodies. Let's eat. She put on the table a jar of her mother's pickled porcini mushrooms, crumbly boiled potatoes, a good piece of smoked meat, and a jar of pickles she had bought at the parking lot. And you say we'll order a pizza. She winked at her friends, who were numb with delight. She was angry at her friends teasing. What could she do? All her friends had been married a long time, so they poked fun at Kathy for being so unmarried. How delicious. Emily clapped her hands as she admired the table. Look at those mushrooms. They are white, aren't they, Olga? So, where are the plates? White ones. Kathy nodded. Daddy goes to the woods himself, picks them. And he doesn't take every mushroom, only the best ones. Help yourself. Hello, I heard from the door. Kathy looked back at the voice. Betty was stomping embarrassedly on the doorstep. This pregnant orphan had been sent here to await delivery, and the staff all felt sorry for the poor girl. She, poor thing, was twice unlucky. Not only was she an orphan, but her fiancé, a scoundrel major, ran away as soon as he found out she was pregnant. I didn't make it in time for the abortion, admitted Betty Kathy. I walked from the clinic and thought, I'm going to get to the bridge now, and I'm going to drown myself. And as I walked, I realized that I really wanted to have a baby. Maybe I'll have a daughter, my helper. Kathy stroked the girl's pale, skinny arm. Her anemia was bad, I could tell without any tests. And how could it be any different on a meager hospital diet? What's it like here? You can't starve to death, but you can't count on variety either. In the morning there was porridge and a piece of bread with butter. And for lunch there was liquid soup. For the second meal we had some stewed vegetables and boiled fish. Dinner was the tastiest meal. There were pancakes and casseroles. But all the goodness was still bland, and there was a catastrophic shortage of fresh fruit and vegetables. Betty never complained. 
Others had caring mothers and mothers-in-law with homemade baked goods, their husbands sending them huge bags full of fruit and chocolates. One Betty only made do with oatmeal and lean soups in the maternity hospital cafeteria, and she considered boiled Pollock a sumptuous delicacy. Hello, Betty. How are you feeling? Not packed yet. Kathy winked. Well, it won't be long now. Let me give you some tasty pickles, eh? Don't just stand there. Come in, sit down, eat with us. Don't be shy. Would you like some pickles? And I'll make you a sandwich. Look at that meat. Just the smell of it will drive you crazy. The cucumber jar opened tightly. I must have spent a lot of time in my grandmother's cellar. But when the lid was finally removed, the aroma of the spicy pickle was instantly in the air. Now Betty, wait. Kathy looked for a fork with her eyes. Now we're going to pick up a pickle and oh, what's that? The fork bumped into something hard. And in a moment, Kathy pulled out a small plastic bag, folded several times, and wrapped with duct tape and tied with woolen string for security. Look girls, we seem to have found a treasure, she shouted cheerfully as she unwrapped her unexpected find. Inside was a small silver pendant, a five-leaf chestnut. Wow, it's beautiful. Emily, the ubiquitous Emily, was loudly admiring it. If we could find more of these things, we wouldn't have to work. We've got to get it back somehow, Kathy said confusedly, holding the thin silver leaf in her palm. Oh, said Betty, who had sat silent until then. That's strange. She touched a simple black lace around her neck. I have a pendant just like that. Here, she tugged at the lace, and out of the neck of her nightgown came a similar pentameter. Do you see it? They're the same. I just don't remember where mine came from. I've had it since I was a kid. My teachers said they dropped me off at my doorstep when I was a newborn, and I was wearing this pendant. They took it away, of course. They gave it back to me when I was older. I'll go there again tomorrow, Kathy decided. It's the weekend, so there's no time to waste. The weather this time, too, was not pleasant. A disgustingly cold wind seemed to penetrate my bones, whipping me with raindrops. Autumn. Kathy never liked it. The damp, the early darkness and the cold, the cold as far away as spring. There are fewer street vendors today. The man with the mushrooms must have decided not to risk his health in this bad weather, and there were fewer old ladies. However, the same grandmother with the pickles was at her post. When she saw Kathy, she smiled meekly. Hello, daughter. Do you like the cucumbers? I have more. Just take it. I don't want any money from you. How much you gave me last time? That's for me for two days. No, no, Granny, that's not why I'm here. Kathy interrupted the stream of thanks. When I opened your jar yesterday, she took a silver pendant out of her pocket. I found this. Grandma squinted her blinded eyes and looked more closely. Oh, my daughter. She spluttered with her hands. Thank you, my dear sweetheart. It was me, the old one. I hid it myself in the jar from the thieves. Thieves came to the village. Every day someone gets robbed. I hid it myself and forgot about it. I am very old. The old woman carefully held the pendant in her palm, stroking it with her finger. People say it is true. The old age is not a joy. I have no eyes to see, no memory at all. Grandmother, Kathy decided. Did you buy this pendant yourself? Or maybe someone gave it to you? Forgive me for asking. It's just that. It was my daughter's gift, the old woman said sadly, and her voice trembled. She came from the city once, a long time ago. She gave me this bling. She bought one for herself too. 25 years passed. I haven't seen it since. She used to send my mother money, but now she's gone. I see. Do you know? Why did you ask my daughter? It was as if the grandmother had woken up from her memories, and her eyes became sharp and testing. Maybe you've seen her, and a something of mine. Now it was important to find the right words. Not to over-encourage, but not to scare away. I, Kathy said hesitantly, can't promise anything. But I'll see what I can find out about your daughter. Her name is Anda, isn't it? What's her full name? Miranda she is, the old woman answered eagerly. And the last name? Beale. Only you won't find her daughter. I've already tried. I went to the police, and I asked my friends to find out. And as I understand it, it didn't work out. 
It didn't work out. The old woman smiled. It was, but it didn't work out. There's nothing to be done about the old days. Anda must be doing well. She was a tough girl. Back Kathy returned without noticing the time. The more she pondered the two silver twin pendants, the more certain she became that orphan Betty was the granddaughter of grandmother merchant. That would be great. The old lady would find a family member and a great grandson would be born soon or a great granddaughter. And Betty would be so happy to know she wasn't the only one in the world. She would come to visit her grandmother or maybe she would move to the village for good. Kathy imagined the old lady's house. It must be warm and always tidy. The floor is cleanly swept and the windows hung with cozy floral curtains. Probably there are still feather beds and warm comforters. Betty would snuggle up there and wake up in the morning to the smell of pies. The pictures my imagination drew were so sweet and idyllic that I didn't want to go back to reality. But you have to, don't you? At least because between the old lady and her supposed granddaughter, there must be another intermediary named Miranda Beale. Where to find her? At home, to the lulling purr of the cat, Kathy tried to draw up at least a rough plan of action. There was no point in asking the orphanage where Betty was raised. The girl had once mentioned that she had been dropped off on the front porch of the orphanage and left there, like a kitten in a wicker basket. It turns out you can't find out anything there, so how should you go about it? Of course, you can try to look for maternity hospitals and women's clinics. Miranda must have been seen somewhere before the birth of her daughter. But first of all, it's unlikely that they will give you this information. Secondly, even if they do provide it, who will say that Miranda gave birth to her daughter in this town and not in, say, the next town? And finally, who's to say that she didn't give birth at home in her kitchen at all? No, this only widens the circle of search, and it should be the other way around. Kathy rubbed her forehead with her fingers. Why is everything so confusing? She suddenly noticed that the cat was no longer purring, but sitting on the floor, enthusiastically chasing some rustling paper on the floor. What did you find there? The girl asked, leaning toward the cat. The cat blinked his green eyes and meowed hoarsely, short and demanding. Kathy picked up the crumpled paper that the cat had been amusing itself with. James Brooks, she read. Yeah, the same guy she'd saved and then spent four days recovering. I owe you one, he said at the time. What kind of debtor though? What was she to do? Leave him there alone? Nonsense. Games lived a lonely life, and so Kathy's visit was even welcomed. You go into the kitchen. He invited me in. We'll have some tea now. Or do you want coffee? Thank you. Tea is fine. The girl looked around the kitchen, small but surprisingly cozy. The walls were hand-painted, and what chopping boards? Unusual stamped boards, but real works of art. They take a long time to make, are cut out one by one, and look so beautiful that it is a pity to use them for their intended purpose. My wife was an artist, James explained. She painted the walls. She said it was her idea of heaven. Well, that was hers. My paradise is in the garage. I like working with cars. But it's a shame to paint over it too. You like it? I like it very much, Kathy answered honestly. Your wife, she's already. No, the man grinned. She's alive and well and thriving. She just fell in love with someone else. She lives with him now. While talking about it, for some reason he touched the bandage on his neck. Is that him then? Asked the girl. Was it him? It's in the past, the host said curtly. Tell me, why did you want to see me? Do you need help? Oh, yes, I would. Kathy mumbled confusedly. You see, I bought a jar of pickles from my grandmother the other day, and when I opened it, I found a silver pendant in it. Such, you know, inexpensive in appearance, but it does not matter. I gave it back to my grandmother, and she told me it was a gift from her daughter, who disappeared 25 years ago. And most importantly, James, there were two pendants. Two, you see. The daughter kept the other one. I mean, how can a man just disappear without a trace like that? Maybe, James grinned. It's not such a trick, if you ask me. But you know something else, don't you? I know, confirmed the girl. I happen to find out something else important. And here's the thing. I know a girl who was an orphan, when she was a baby. No, when she was a baby, 
she was abandoned to an orphanage and she grew up there. And she's had the same pendant since birth. Of course, she can't be that grandmother's daughter, but maybe. Granddaughter. The man suggested. That's certainly possible. And what is the daughter's name, do you know? Of course. And here. Kathy pulled a piece of paper from her pocket with the woman's name written on it. Bill Miranda, born on the 23rd of September, 72nd. Now she must be, I mean, somewhere in her 50s. If you could help me somehow track her down. Why? This question caught the girl off guard. And really, why? Until now, she had not asked herself that, acting more out of curiosity, like a detective who unwinds an interesting story. But now, James nodded understandingly. Let me tell you something. I'm not an old man anymore, and I've been working in, wherever. Now, I know for a fact that it's better not to pry into other people's secrets. You think there's a pot of gold in the middle of this matryoshka, but there might as well be a puddle of sticky mud. And what's more, that's how it turns out most of the time. Suppose you find her, this, Miranda. And what do you tell her? Hello, I bought pickles from your mother. So what? Do you know why she doesn't want to visit her mother? What if she has a good reason? Or let's take the darkest scenario. The woman is dead, for whatever reason. Would you tell that to the old lady? I don't know, but there's also a granddaughter, and she. And you're sure your grandmother needs her? Do you know anything at all about this old lady, or are you just feeling sorry for her? Do you know what kind of person she is if her own daughter ran away from her? Kathy was stunned into silence. I had to admit, the master was right. Or Miranda is alive and doing well. Are you hoping to make her feel sorry for her daughter? James continued. The same daughter that your Miranda dropped off at the orphanage. Do you think she'll be happy and rushed to buy her earrings for the pendant? I, said the girl helplessly, I hadn't thought about it. And now you're saying, and I even think you're probably right. But for some reason I can't give it up either. I'm already mixed up in it. Though it seems like I'm the only one who needs it. What should I do now? She asked, quite childishly at a loss. What to do? If you can, give it all up. Forget it. They're not your secrets and you don't need them. But if you can't give it up, then fine, I'll try to help you. So you will find Miranda. Kathy rejoiced. Not me personally, the man answered. But I have a retired relative. He used to be an investigator, but now he's moonlighting as a private detective. I'll try to find out something through him. The delivery room was cool and bright. Soft, soothing music played softly, and the walls were painted a pleasant pink. But neither the young woman in labor nor the midwife noticed the cozy surroundings. Let's wipe your forehead, Kathy said affectionately, and she blotted the sweat on Betty's forehead. It won't be long now, my dear, it won't be long now and then all the pain will be forgotten. Hold on. I can't. Betty looked up at the midwife with exhausted eyes. My back feels like it's breaking on a contraction. It hurts, it's horrible. It's the baby on the back of your head, Kathy said sympathetically, so you're feeling the pressure. There's nothing you can do about it. You've got to be patient, Betty. Tired. Kathy looked at her watch. The first contractions had started during the night, and it was now four in the afternoon. Poor girl, exhausted. Should we anesthetize her? Nancy, who peeked into the delivery room, suggested. It's too late for anesthesia. She'll give birth any minute now. No anesthesia will have time to take effect. Breathe, Betty. Breathe. Betty, biting her lip bloodily, clutched at the gurney. Get on the chair. Kathy shouted. Come on. Toma, don't sleep, help. Nancy immediately grabbed the gurney by the headboard. Together with Kathy, they rolled it to the birthing chair itself. Betty, the contraction's about to end. Then get on all fours and crawl over to the chair. That's it. That's it. Good job. Nancy, pick up. Nancy was already adjusting the backrest, putting Betty in a half-sitting position. Okay, okay, you'll be more comfortable. Kathy encouraged her. Now when it starts, put your chin to your chest and push as hard as you can. Do you understand me? That's it, come on. And I won't die. The girl suddenly asked quite clearly, because, you know, sometimes they say that. They're talking nonsense. Kathy cut him off. Don't listen to nonsense, listen to me. 
That's it, the contraction's on. Push. The girl growled through clenched teeth in frustration. Come on, come on, all right, girl. Stop, 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 Betty. Stop. I can't. Betty moaned. I can't stop. All right, let it be. More than more. The cry of the newborn filled the entire space. Well done, mommy, congratulated Kathy, placing the baby on her mother's belly. And what an extraordinary beauty we have born, and what a vocal one. Betty smiled with pale, biting lips. Maybe she'll be a singer, she whispered. The little girl on her belly screamed desperately. Sha, 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 the young mother gently stroked her warm back. You have a serious laceration, said the gynecologist after another examination. You'll have to stay with us for a while, Betty. Betty looked at her daughter asleep at her breast. Is it necessary? I've been here for two weeks. It's better at home. Come on. Kathy smiled. It's at home, but you can't even walk 10 steps yet. So lie down like a human, because no one's going to keep you here forever. Betty shrugged her shoulders. It's only going to get harder later on. They take care of me here, feed me and feed me, and take care of my daughter. I'm used to it. And when I come home, I'll do everything myself. You'll get used to it at home. Kathy tried to reassure her. Everyone gets used to it. But what's wrong with you? Betty, those words don't seem to be particularly inspiring. Kathy looked at her anxiously. She hadn't heard from James, and day by day the hope of finding Betty's mother faded. In addition, doubts arose. Why did she think Miranda was the orphan girl's mother at all? The silver pendant itself meant nothing. After all, it was obviously cheap, which meant that there could be thousands of such imitations all over the country. After all, she had been wrong to get involved in this business. Oh, for nothing. What did she want to achieve, I wonder? To make an old woman happy? Orphan Betty? And she never bothered to ask them if they needed it. Were you looking for the truth? And never once thought about what to do with that truth. The phone beeped briefly with a new message. The girl glanced at the screen. It was James. Kathy, we have to meet. There's something I've learned. Miranda Beale lived in a luxury Riverside apartment complex. Kathy remembered that a couple of years ago there was a huge wasteland here, and students used to have their drinking parties here. Back then, the shore was streamed with trash. There were empty bottles of cheap beer, mountains of cigarette butts, but that was the best. There were items of a more intimate nature. They built up quickly, didn't they? The door was opened by a handsome tall blonde man. Hello. Are you Kathy? The girl nodded. I came to Miranda. I called her. I know, the boy smiled. Mom's waiting for you. My name is Greg. Please come in, don't be shy. Miranda Beale turned out to be a fat smiling lady. She looked much younger than her age. She was sitting in a cozy chair, upholstered in a light fabric with a floral pattern. There was an elegant tea table in front of her and a beige, even if it looked soft and fluffy, rug adorned the floor. Provence, remembered Kathy. That was the name of the style in the fashion magazines. Light furniture, floral ornaments, delicate compositions of dried flowers in delicately laconic vases. The hostess did not stand up to meet her guest, but looked at her expectantly, with a kindly smile on her lips. Kathy noticed that her hands were well-groomed, with skin so smooth, almost girlish, that it was immediately clear. This person did not do physical labor, my God, what if all this, the name and the date of birth, is just a monstrous coincidence? This elegant lady does not look like someone who would forget her mother and throw her daughter out on the street. Have a seat, Kathy. Beale pointed to the chair across from her own. Is there something you wanted to tell me? Kathy didn't move from her seat. Sit down. Would you like some tea? Aye, the girl's throat went dry, and she had to speak in a husky, foreign voice wanted to tell you about. You had a pendant, a silver pentacle, wasn't it? Let's say, Beale's handsome face showed nothing but polite interest. But why are you interested? And the other one, Kathy continued, is exactly the same one you once gave to your mother. The question clearly hit the mark. Where had all the softness and civility gone? The landlady squinted and pressed her lips together tightly. Her features instantly sharpened, becoming unpleasant. Kathy suddenly thought it was more obvious how old she really was. 
I haven't spoken to my mother in years. Beale's voice changed, too. The timbre was the same, but there were metallic notes in it. We've always had a complicated relationship. I don't know anything about her. Does she need help? She needs the money badly, the girl shrugged. You know what pensions are like now, and... So she sent you to ask me for money? Beale asked in surprise. What a senseless complication. She could have done it herself. All right, how much does she need? No, no, Kathy interrupted. She didn't ask for anything, and she doesn't even know I'm here. I haven't told you everything yet. The second pendant ended up in the possession of a girl who grew up in an orphanage. We met by chance, she, I work as a midwife, and the girl. She just recently gave birth to a beautiful daughter, and I thought, I thought you could be her mother. Was I wrong? Beale twitched her rounded shoulder irritably. Do you want to make a fuss? She asked. I wouldn't advise you to go to a journalist. It would still be impossible to prove, but your name would be in the news, and you would probably be labeled a swindler. In addition, unsuccessful, which is probably the most offensive. But my business reputation is not likely to be damaged by this story. Is it worth starting? Kathy shook her head. You misunderstood me, she said quietly. I just thought you might want to. Want to see your daughter, your granddaughter, visit your mother. After all, I found your daughter. And you yourself became a grandmother. The other day your daughter gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. My granddaughter. Did she think there were tears glistening in the woman's eyes? But she couldn't see, she looked away too quickly. Miranda. Kathy tried to speak as softly and gently as possible. You're not insensitive, I can tell. My mother, Beale interrupted dryly, and anyway, it doesn't matter. She would never accept me with a child, never. All she wanted was for me to supply her with money, uninterrupted and increasing amounts. Oh yes, her appetites were very, very impressive. I tried to please her, and for a while I even succeeded. But when the money ran out, I turned out to be an ungrateful, unscrupulous daughter, a slacker, and God knows what else. My mother did not care that I was downsized at work, and the landlady literally threw me out on the street. Stupid, I guess, but I am still ashamed that I do not see her. Even though I understand that my mother did everything for it, with her own hands, she's paid the price, Kathy said softly. She drove you away and condemned herself to a miserable and lonely old age. Isn't that payback for the greed and insensitivity she's shown you? Think about it, it's scary to be old and needless. You should have seen the spontaneous market by the side of the road. There are cars rushing by, traders swearing, and your mother goes there, in any weather, to sell some of her homemade pickles. Is this what she dreamed of? That kind of old age? Everyone has what they deserve. Beale lit a cigarette. The cigarette was long and thin and smelled like strawberries for some reason. You wouldn't believe how often I wanted her homemade pickles especially when I had to spend the night in other people's houses. And the only food I had was what kind people gave me. And I didn't meet them every day. Yes, I often thought about my mom's goodies. But for some reason I never got a single jar, not even the smallest one. Are you going to tell me now that I should forget about it? Or should I think of it as an educational stunt that was supposed to teach me something good? No, I won't say that. Your mother was cruel to you. And you may or may not forgive her. But don't make the same mistake yourself. You have a daughter and a granddaughter. Don't push them away. Daughter. Beale shook her head sadly. She would never forgive me. I wouldn't. Her father wasn't my husband. He wasn't much of a man either. I got pregnant and I was afraid to tell him. He was. He thought he was an artist. In fact, it was just a convenient excuse for his eternal idleness and drunkenness. I worked and he drank all the money away. One day, I decided that I would never give him another penny. Then that rebellious creative person beat me up so badly that I ended up with three broken ribs. Have you ever had your ribs broken? No. Kathy shook her head. Then, Beale said with a hard chuckle, You're lucky. You know, with broken ribs, it hurts to breathe. But I adapted. Even kept going to work. Yeah. The pregnancy then became noticeable. And that's when I realized that my whole former life had been paradise. The painter almost lost his mind at the realization that he now had to feed me and the baby. 
He didn't dry off for a week, and then he disappeared. I still loved him. Sat in an empty apartment and waited. A couple of days later, they found him somewhere in the woods. Who the hell knew who it was? You know, it could have been anybody he kept company with, but the apartment was his, and I wasn't allowed to stay there. Immediately some relatives showed up. My job didn't need the maternity pay either, so they neatly fired me. Where to go? I managed to rent a tiny room and lived there for a couple of months until I ran out of money. Then they kicked me out of there too. I remember it was raining terrible cold and I was going to the maternity hospital with contractions. I was giving birth to my daughter and I was glad it was warm. When I gave birth, I can't even remember where we lived and how we lived, but I was lucky I met Greg's father. He was a rich man with his own business, with connections. I don't know what he saw in me. I was dirty and hungry all the time. My eyes were drooping and my hair was falling out. But something I did catch him. You could say he even fell in love with me, as much as he could, and he was ready to marry me. But on one condition, I had to get rid of my daughter. He didn't want someone else's child, especially one with the genes of an artist father. So I took my daughter to the doorstep of the orphanage. I put my own pendant on her because I thought I could eventually convince my husband to take her away. But it didn't work out. My husband didn't want to hear about my daughter. Then Greg was born and somehow I calmed down. My husband was happy about it. He thought that now we finally had a normal family. And a few years later he crashed in an accident. And here I was running a business, raising my son, and it seemed like I had everything except peace of mind and peace of mind. Secrets. Don't pry into other people's secrets. James knew what he was talking about, and he gave the right advice. But the silly little Kathy didn't listen, and now she doesn't know what to do with all the truth that's come crashing down on her. What was she thinking when she set out to unravel this story? Did she think the truth was like a fairy tale? But it turned out to be much more mundane than that. Excuse me. Beale stood up from her seat, letting Kathy know that their conversation had come to an end. I have to go to work. Greg escorted her to the door. Don't get so upset, he advised. You are a good girl, so you from your own kindness, and it seemed that you are like a fairy with wings, and everything will be fine. But it doesn't always work out that way. Did you hear our conversation? That's a strong word. More like eavesdropping. The boy's lips touched a cheeky chuckle. Yes, yes, eavesdropping is wrong, I know. But I'm a big boy now, it's too late to re-educate me. Don't you agree? Kathy suddenly felt how terribly tired she was today. I don't give a damn, she said indifferently. It wasn't my job to raise you. Tell me better, can I call a cab from your phone? Mine is dead. You could, Greg smiled. You don't have to. Why don't you let me take you? Don't, I'm very. Tired of our family? I know. We'll consider it a small moral compensation. He threw on his jacket and opened the door in front of the girl. Let's go. And suddenly Kathy laughed. There was something about the brunette. Maybe his adorable sass, like that of a yard boy. Well, let's go. What can you do? She said. Greg took her firmly by the hand and led her to the elevator. This too was attractive in its own way. He didn't ask permission, didn't try to please her, didn't wait. I have scabies, Kathy quipped, just in case. And you took my hand. Now you're going to get it. Ah, itching is nothing. I've had it a hundred times before. I've had it a hundred times before, one more time and one less time. By the way, I know a cool ointment for this plague. Would you like me to bring it to you? I wonder, she wasn't pretending much anymore. Where do you always get that contagion from? I'm a dog handler, Greg explained. In my spare time, I volunteer at the dog shelter, which you know, has scabies, shingles, and a wide range of diseases. So if you pick up any nonsense from a pet, come to me. I'll tell you how to cure it. All right? He stopped in front of the car and suddenly looked Kathy straight in the eye. The girl flinched in surprise. The guy had a wonderful look in his eyes. Sapphire blue with sparkles of mocking in the depths. What eyes you have? Kathy whispered lostly. Blue. Greg shrugged and winked. Don't trust your first impression. It's the lenses. Shall we go for coffee? No, he was definitely capable of fooling anyone. 
but how masterful. I don't want coffee, she said with a charming smile. I don't like coffee at all. He was already getting into the car. I love it. Have a seat. I want coffee, and you want a cup of tea. Would that work for you? It's fine. So what are we waiting for? I'm sure your husband won't be jealous of a little thing like that. I don't have a husband. Kathy got angry. Why is everyone so interested in my absent personal life? No. All the better. Sit down. The interior of the car smelled like something sweet. Are you sneaking candy from your mom in here? The girl asked jokingly. Everything is soaked in vanilla. No, he said seriously. First of all, I've lived apart from my mother for a long time now, so there's no reason for me to hide. Is that so? Yeah, I'm just stopping by to see her. And bring vanilla candy? Kathy squinted. Passed it again. My mom prefers rum. And the smell of vanilla. I just smoke in the car. Here. Greg pulled a crumpled pack from the glove compartment. Cigarillos like this. With vanilla impregnation. Would you like to try some? I don't smoke. The girl arrogantly declared, but there was laughter in her eyes. Greg rated it. Then I'll quit too. The packet flew into the back seat. We'll get to a trash can and throw it away, he pulled out of the parking lot. And don't worry about mom. I think I can talk her into it. Are you sure? Kathy asked sadly. Why did he start that conversation again? After all, she had almost calmed down. I'm sure, Greg said after a moment's reflection. And for some reason Kathy immediately wanted to believe him. The house was old, unmaintained. The tenants used the balconies as storage for that special kind of junk that was no longer good for anything, but they felt sorry to throw it away for some reason. And in this house lived Betty and her baby. It's here, Kathy said. You want us to come with you? Miranda looked up to where Betty's windows glowed on the fourth floor. I, no. I guess I'd better do it myself. You sit here and wait. She got out of the car and headed for the driveway. Do you think Betty will forgive her? Kathy asked anxiously. Greg took her hand and squeezed it tightly in his. That gentle touch made the girl feel a little calmer. I don't know, Kathy, he answered. But at least now, she'll have a chance to forgive. And Mom will have a chance to be forgiven. They both need it. Miranda Beale stopped in front of a shabby, old door. No metal, no wood. Typical shabby, upholstered in oilcloth. She could only put her shoulder to the door and squeeze it open. God, how her daughter lived. Beale called. Betty opened the door at once. It was as if she was standing outside the door, waiting for the bell to ring. Or maybe she was. Surely Kathy and Greg had done their best to prepare her. Hello, the landlady said without a smile. You don't have to introduce yourself, Kathy told me about you, and you have a good son. Congratulations. Your brother, the woman clarified. My son is your younger brother. And that, Betty crossed her arms over her chest, is the big question. We don't have the same fathers, and you, you were his mother, and I was dropped off at the orphanage. So you're a stranger to me. There was a child's crying coming from the apartment. I can't talk, my daughter cried. Can I see her? Beale asked. Betty waved her hand irritably. Do whatever you want. I don't care about you. Upon entering Betty's cramped apartment, the woman shuddered involuntarily. It looked too much like the room she, Miranda Beale, had once rented. One and the same. Betty took her daughter out of the stroller and placed her on the couch. And we're wet girls, she cooed as she took off the baby's onesies. Mama's going to change her pretty little girl. Miranda knelt down next to the couch. The baby looked at her curiously and the woman's heart clenched briefly and painfully. She looks just like you, Betty. You were exactly the same. Wait, she gently pulled the girl aside. Let me change her. The baby was not at all afraid of strange hands with unfamiliar scent. On the contrary, she laughed when Beale gently patted her belly. Well, Miranda fastened the last button on the onesie and carefully lifted the girl in her arms. Now go to your mother. Betty put her daughter to her breast and looked at her mother again, but without the coldness of the past. I'm sorry, girl, the woman said without getting up from her knees. I am so sorry for you. I'll never get rid of my shame. She buried her face in her hands, and her voice was muffled. 
I do not know how to justify myself because there are no excuses. And I don't know what to do now either. Betty's hand touched her hair. Don't cry, mommy. Why think about the past when there is a future? Look, what a granddaughter you have born. It was hot in the village house. Or maybe it was just the air warming from people's breath. Miranda, sitting next to her elderly mother, and on the other side of the table looked at old Betty with her sleeping daughter in her arms. I thought, said Beale, you only want money from me. The old woman answered her with a stern, though tear-fogged, look. Anda, Anda, I haven't touched a penny of your money. I put every penny of it in my book. I thought you're young, life can turn on its head. What if you needed money? I'd have given it to you right away. It's all safe now. I put it in my book, and it's still there. And Beale, crying loudly into her mother's shoulder. Don't cry, don't cry, grumbled the old woman. She thought of crying too. We can only rejoice now. You were right, James, Kathy said. She sat in his apartment, in the kitchen, the walls of which were painted with heavenly motifs, drinking fragrant tea, and talking about everything that had happened since the last time they had met. When I unraveled their whole story, there was a lot there that was probably better not to know. Is that so? And I warned you, said the man. Well, what now? Put it out of your mind. It won't work, Kathy sighed guiltily, and then smiled. I'm marrying Miranda's son. Well? James marveled. To Greg? What a number, Kathy. Well, God give you all the best. He's not a bad fellow, I think. Will you come to the wedding? Kathy squinted slyly. I brought you an invitation. Greg and I will be waiting for you. If it hadn't been for you, we might never have met. Would we? You're welcome to come. I'll come, but what about Miranda? Her mother, her daughter, her granddaughter. You didn't tell me anything about them. Did they all meet at least? What did they say to each other? The girl wondered. They all need time. Miranda helps her mother with money. She sees her daughter and granddaughter. At first they were so, wary or something. And now everyone has thought out. Miranda bought a house, a huge one. She's taking her mother in last week, and Betty and the baby have already moved in today. And Greg gets along with everybody. That's the way he is, he's good with people. Time, the man repeated. Well, we'll wait and see, and all we'll see now is good things.